Welcome to the Shield Wall Podcast, where tempered men are formed. You're listening to another episode of the Shield Wall Podcast. I'm Ethan. I'm Seth. I'm Cody. How are you guys doing today? Doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. That's very considerate of you. Doing good, man. The weather's changed. It's pretty good. So how's all your uh, wedding planning going, Ethan? It is going. You know, it's it's stressful for me um, specifically. It, it, it's the kind of thing where we went into wedding planning expecting Grace to be the kind of the, stre- the stressed one because she's <laughs> doing school and all of that and and, and has, has so much on her mind on, the, on a daily basis. But Man, really, it's been me. He's been the the stressed one. So mm. they usually say like the wedding prep's the easiest part. Marriage is the harder. Just joking. Uh, <laughs> I hated marriage you know, prep. Saw jokes. <laughs> saw jokes. You know, I was All actually jokes. talking to uh, to Barrett, and one of the things his wife was saying was was you know. I hated being engaged. Like being engaged is is like all of the responsibility, all of the work, and 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 like none of the like the emotional, physical, and all of those benefits to marriage. So, you know, some people do think that um, marriage is a lot hard or less less hard than than engagement. So, you got to walk through the Red Sea to get to the Promised Land. Boom! Spiritualize that passage for you. I think for for me because I was um, we got married within six months. We got engaged within about four months of knowing each other, and so. Dang. You don't mess yeah. up. You don't like. You don't miss any time. No man <laughs> can't get it back. When it's um, right, it's right. Yeah, some regrets. We didn't go through and f- complete our premarital counseling. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that stuff has. It did come back to bite me. So I do recommend that highly to stay with that plan and um, take care of that. Um, our pastor switched from our church to another church in the middle of that. So. <clears throat> Yeah. That wasn't a very good lesson on commitment, now was it? It, it wasn't. <laughs> it was twofold. <laughs> Shaking um, my head. So that was stressful, but there was also things that I just probably was inexperienced with and just didn't um, follow through on. And just, you know, yeah, it was just, it, it definitely brought out some deficiencies in me. And marriage? The what? Pre, the pre marriage oh, part. Oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> so that, marriage can do that, bring out deficiencies in people. I've also heard that's kind of the that's kind, kind of, of the, the purpose. purpose. Yeah. <laughs> so uh yeah, that, it, it was ultimately it was fun, it was good. We got married and she's still with me. So thanks, Alicia. I appreciate <laughs> it. Alicia's great. Yeah. She's, she's six years and three babies. She's patient. She's yep. a patient woman right there. So guys, we didn't gather here to talk about marriage. That's a, that's on a coming episode. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's coming good. up. <laughs> yeah, but Ethan, why have you gathered us here together today? I wanted to talk about holiness, the holiness of God today with the you guys. Holiness. holiness of God. It's a it's an important topic. Um, it's really important. I don't think you can. I don't think you can be a, a theologically rounded Christian without having a good understanding of God's holiness. Um, so I wanted to talk about a couple of things. I wanted to talk about sin and a little bit about sanctification, um, to kind of give people some, some working knowledge to, um, to kind of maybe like either on ramp them into more study or to give them a good working understanding to, to kind of cause a little bit more questions and, um, a little bit more, more study and, and, um, more, more challenge for people um, if they have some kind of preconceived notion about God or themselves or their sin. So yeah, the, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up because this was actually a topic that that I didn't know I needed to know. Mm. And mm. and when I found out about when I found out about it, it opened my eyes. So so what kind of led to you realizing that you needed to have an understanding of this? So. Um, after college, after living on my own for a while, I began to realize that um, people had a lot of things that they said that I knew I disagreed with, <laughs> but I didn't know how to disagree with them. And uh, one of those things was, you know, I'm a good person. I'm just basically a good person. I haven't murdered anybody. I know that's like the cliche thing that everyone says that everyone says, but it, I'm it's not, actually I'm not Hitler, said. okay? Yeah. <laughs> then in. Uh, so I I would always be like, I know that's wrong, but I don't, how do I? I don't know why it's wrong. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I know 
I know it's wrong. I know why it's wrong, but I don't know how to articulate. But I also don't know. So there was just a lot of confusion. Obviously, that was me being confused. Um, and then when we went to this youth retreat, and I heard this this guy uh, talk, he was very influenced by John Piper. Um, but, John Pipey. <laughs> he was Love uh, some John Piper. But he he talked about the holiness of God and man in in connection to that holiness. Uh, I don't want to jump the gun as far as the outline goes, but some of the things that he brought up were Isaiah 6, the passage yeah. where the the seraphim, they had wings that covered their hands, their face, their eyes, their feet. Um, and these things weren't just for show. Like they had to cover these uh, these parts of their bodies to be able to minister and be in the presence of the Lord who was on the throne. And, yeah. uh, and also like that picture along with Isaiah and him just basically starting to disintegrate when he was confronted with this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's with this picture of the Lord. Yeah. I encountered that verse kind of, I, I encountered that verse in detail when I read R.C. Sproul's, um, the holiness of God. And he goes into detail about in, in either his first or his second chapter, he, R.C. had a personal experience with, with God in, in a church in the middle of the night. It's a cool story. If you guys haven't read the book, I recommend it. Um, but he goes into that, chapter of, of Isaiah and how kind of um, Isaiah was kind of known as as the most righteous man in Israel and he encounters God and is just like blown apart. Yeah. Like at the spiritual seams. I'm um, undone. Yeah. Mm. We'll uh we'll talk about that later. Yeah, because that's a that's an awesome, awesome chapter. What about you, Cody? What what kind of started your um what kind of led to your need to understand God and, and how holy he is? Uh, probably when I got, <clears throat> when the Lord saved me a couple of years ago. When so right I was, at the beginning. Yeah, I think <laughs> right at the beginning because who I was in, 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 encountered, who I encountered with um, regards to who was teaching me. I had a pastor who was um, very in tune with, um, you know, practical theology and not just knowing what the Bible said, but he was a married man who had children and he had been through a few churches and he had seen um, what church culture looks like when you deviate from just reading God's word and reading it for um, the strength of the congregation in your own life. And so yeah. I've mentioned him before as pastor Jason Smith of Harvest Point and Charlestown. He was the first guy who kind of identified certain traits in me that maybe I'd be able to, you know, serve the church. And I at first I had a, like it was a holy fear. Mm -hmm. Like you're asking me to do what? <laughs> you know, the Bible says that you know not many of us should be teachers because we'll be held to a stricter account. We'll be judged for every word. Everybody will be, but you know, as the church goes, those that do teach you. I read that and I was like, there's an awesome fear. Mm -hmm. And so I remember when he asked me, he said, "Consider it. I I, I trust that the Lord's called you to this, but." The confirmation can't be external. You have to know and you have to desire it. And so um, he met me at the, the Lord's Chicken House in Chick-fil-A. Chick <laughs> and at that point, the uh, the everything aligned, and I just knew as I was eating <laughs> that free chicken sandwich, uh, dunking it in the holy Chick-fil-A sauce. Chick sauce. I just it was just for me like the the awesome swelling of God's presence in my mind, the things that I knew became a reality in the moment where here this pastor, this leader has um, just affirmed you, but mm -hmm. basically said in so many words, can you do anything else? And I remember this thinking like, no, I want to serve the Lord. And so that really um, put me in a place locally at a church where I was, I, I had to have the responsibility of teaching. Mm hmm and so I did that, and the, one of the first things I did was I started to study. I was yeah. like, I don't know who this guy is. This is Jesus. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the God the Father. I, I might think I know, but now I'm going to have to tell people about him. And uh, so th just being involved in the local church and having my pastor affirm um, a calling on my life and then giving the, being given that opp opportunity and reading the passages that come along with what responsibility looks like, I... um. I just just have deep sense in my heart that I can't take this lightly. Yeah. I have to look at the scripture. I have to have a life of purity. I have to walk with the Lord. And uh, it has to be something where in my heart, I know that I've served him 
Well, because he's holy, and I want to be a representative on earth in such a way that it brings him much glory, not me, and I don't want to profane his name or take his name in vain. And I think walking that out of the local church and um, just having that responsibility, and that, that, that showed me a picture of it. And then reading some books, I think R.C. Sproul's The Holiness of God, and I remember listening to a sermon um, by John Piper and even Mark Driscoll, where they just charged forward with how holy God was and how unrighteous men were, but how God has redeemed us by the cross. And so that just gripped me. I haven't lost that. And that's my my, um, initial encounters of, you know, who who God was as he was, as he is holy. My recommendation for you is is don't lose it. Yeah, Yeah, man. Nurture it. Nurture it. Um, For me, I, I don't really know when when kind of I came to the humbling realization that I'm not holy. I mean, I, I grew up in a Christian church, so I always kind of had some, like some recognition or in some, some kind of really basic understanding of sin, sin and uh, what it meant to have a sin nature and what it, what it meant to have a fallen will and um, creaturely will and all that stuff. But I think once I really started studying on my own and, and, and started reading on my own and, Um, praying on my own kind of separate from the church I was going to things just kind of became a lot more clear Um, I was in count I I, I like really came to a deep understanding of how sinful like men are Um, not men as in like men like as the race of men yeah Um, I'm talking like um, mankind in general Mm -hmm. like and it's not only Adam and the daughters of Eve Mm -hmm. indeed Um, it's not only what men do, it's their condition. They're born into it. Like it's a, it's, it's not only a transgression, it's a condition. Um, and we'll kind of get into that as we start to talk about sin a little bit more. But I think, I think that talking about and having a good understanding of sin can, is the only thing that can lead to a good understanding of, of holiness because, um, because there's an, there's an aspect of sin that any Christian has to understand before they become can become a Christian. Yeah. Like like becoming a Christian, an integral and necessary part of that is repentance. And you can't repent of something if you don't have don't have a realization that that there's anything to repent from. You know? Right. So I wanted to talk about sin and kind of a little bit about it. It's not a, we're not di- diving deep here. Like we need to do an episode on sin and, and sanctification. Um, but it's kind of just a high level, some definitions and, and stuff. Um, so I think, I think for a lot of people, uh, having a misplaced or human view of God's holiness is usually traceable back to a wrong view of sin. Um, I would having, agree. having an unbiblical view of sin greatly affects our views of God. Like that is, Definitely, I have no doubts in my mind that that's the case. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the nature of holiness and kind of how holiness is separateness, um, uniqueness. Um, so what's sin? Um, I have three definitions for you here. Uh, two. All right. Two are, are non-scripture. One is one is scripture. Okay. So. All right. I'm ready for it. Oh, yeah. All right. You guys ready? Ready yes. to get, All ready right. to get uh, convicted? Get ready, old Peppa baby. <laughs> what? <laughs> Pepper baby? The- that's how catchers talk when they are wearing baseball gloves and shouting to pitchers. We right? just had the World Series. Yeah. Come on, Ethan. Oh. Come on. Burn it in there. Burn it Come in. Come on. I'm ready for you. Get on the hot, stinky cheddar. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know what's going on. All right. Baseball back reference. To, it's back okay. to sin definition. Um, so the <laughs> Westminster Larger Catechism defines Amen. sin as um, sin is any want of conformity unto or con- transgression of any law of God given as a rule to the reasonable creature. And then Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology defines sin as any failure to conform to the moral law of God in act, attitude, or nature. And I love that definition. That's kind of my central definition because it it hits three levels of sin that are all important and, and should not be left out. Act as in transgression, as in things that we do willfully. Attitudes, meaning kind of the the um, kind of the sins of of the heart. Uh, not sins of the heart. Yeah, exactly. Um, like if we, I, I mean, 
one one example of a sin of the attitude is looking at God in a way that's not worshipful. And if if we look at God in a spiteful way, that would be a sinful attitude. Mm-hmm. Um, and then nature, mm-hmm. as in like sin nature, as in um, being under Adam instead of under Christ, um, and still having that dead spiritual nature. Um, the inherited is, is kind of, sin, yeah, yeah, the inherited sin, exactly the sin, the, the the sin condition, the sin nature that every person is born with. So, like the original sin passed down from Adam through through his uh, seed. So, we do not talk about tabula rasa in this house. <laughs> None of that heresy up in here. None of that tabula rasa. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Everything you said, I agree with. Um, Romans three twenty three twenty six talks about for all have sinned. And fallen short of the glory of God. The glory yep. associating back with holiness, we're probably going to get into that. But the aspect that we've missed the mark, God has definitively revealed himself. Given the law, not only has he given it in the word, but he's revealed it in the Imago Dei. He's written it on our hearts. So when yeah. we fall short of things that we know that are true by nature, we either excuse the reason why we didn't do them or we... Um, suppress the truth. The, su- suppress the truth. Gosh, I can't talk. <laughs> In unrighteousness. Yes. Oh, it's okay, man. Drink your podcast coffee. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And so this idea of falling short and missing the mark, that is how God reveals to us our sin nature, is that we are not capable of achieving where he uh, needs us to be, which is in a place of completeness and even um, the, 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 the ability to be where he is at, which is a above, not below, and Mm -hmm. um, hitting exactly where he has determined, which is good. We missed the mark. So when we're talking about sin, we're not talking about uh, mixing up words while we're talking. We're talking about something a little bit deeper. Yeah, Yeah, something something that comes from the heart. Um, Yeah, something that comes from the heart. I mean, I can't think of it off the top of my head, but there's some... um, I mean, I mean, uh, so, so Ephesians two uh, mentions being dead in sin. Um, so it's not like it's not like sinners are physically dead in their bodies. They're they're plenty alive, but their inward self, in their heart, they are spiritually dead. Um, and it takes being made alive by God to to um, to to see Him eventually. So we'll actually talk about that later. What it um, like how does man see God, you know, so we'll talk about that later. But, um, the last kind of de- definition that I have here is first John three, four, which says everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness mm-hmm. and sin is lawlessness. So th- this is kind of hitting on the, um, like the action and the attitude, um, parts of Grudem's definition. Sin is like uncontrolled, uncontrolled action, uncontrolled attitude, uncontrolled thought, um, which kind of reminds me of, um, of like how we are supposed to be self-controlled. Like, like the f- fruits of the spirit are contrary and opposite to the fruits of, of sin. So if a fruit of, if one of the fruits of sin is lawlessness, then it would make complete sense that one of the fruits of the spirit is self-control, which it is. So mm-hmm. I think that's a kind of a cool, cool parallel there. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, uh, when you're living in sin, and it's unrepentant, you have a tendency to continue uh, down that path. And I know this this whole thing isn't about sin. We're going to get on holiness. But like when you look at David and uh, the account of, of David and Bathsheba in Second Samuel 11, where he's uh, you know, just kind of being uh, unaware, being lazy in his duties and in his relationship with God. And then uh, you know, he just throws himself into this, uh, lurid relationship and then m- tries to, he lies, murders, and yeah. So it, he, uh, he definitely was not following God's law at that point in time. And it just kind of led more and more into, um, lawlessness. And, and, uh, eventually he repented, obviously, if you don't know the story. But, um, that's what comes to mind when we're talking about lawlessness and how sin leads to that. And, it's like sin begets sin and begets death. One of the things that remind that reminds me of is um, James 1, 12 through 15. Um, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised for those who love him. 
Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But every person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So temptation is a, is is a luring and enticement by something that's already within us. Then desire, desire when it has conceived, give birth gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what you're talking about. It's it's a progression. So, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, didn't mean to cut you off. No, but, go ahead. I was uh, I was finished. Well, I was going to ask you then. Um, so uh, we're not going to dwell on this, but like, what are some impacts of sin? Oh my gosh. That's uh, there. There are so many because um, we so already we see can, that they're death. I mean, death is one of them. That's yeah. Uh, that's like an yeah. ultimate. Yeah, <laughs> and, and um, a, a daily result. You know, mm-hmm. you feel death, and you feel the the bondage of that death because of well, sin. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about this verse more later. But um, Romans three nine through eighteen just is is the thing that I go to. Um, it says, "What then are we Jews any better off? Not at all, for we." For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written, No one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. There They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace is not, they have not known. I mean, that hits so many things, you know, (laughs) being violent, um, shedding blood, um, giving curses and bitterness, um, just deceitful words. uh, um, Their throat is an open grave, having no understanding, having no seeking for God. Like all all of those things are a result of the sin conditions. Oh, yeah. Romans 3 is like a shotgun straight to your pride. (laughs) So... Um, it also, it's like, it recalibrates us. I mean, mm-hmm. if you didn't know that, you're oh, in yeah. this place where you, sin does um, blind you and corrupt your your view of reality. Mm-hmm. Um, you can go and live and live a life that you approve of, maybe a community approves of, because you've all made a practice and a habit of sin, which leads to lawlessness. So now you're outside of. God's providence and his and his not providence his will revealed through the moral law but in the um the insanity of sin is that when you make a practice of it you're operating with a reprobate mind you're an unprincipled person and so it will exhibit fruits of the flesh mm-hmm. this is the law of the re- the law of the harvest reaping and sowing if you sow to the flesh you're going to reap a harvest of unrighteousness and lawlessness mm-hmm. And so um, that's why the Bible tells us as you know, fathers to raise our children up in the way that they should go at a young, early age so that when they get old, they will not depart from it because it's a practice of, of righteousness so that they might reap a harvest of holiness. So you're talking about recalibrating. Um, th- that verse that you just read, Ethan, mm-hmm. how it puts into perspective how uh, unholy we are. And... And that's that's kind of where I came at it, like hearing people say all the time, like, oh, I'm a good person. Like, uh, I I don't do this or I don't do that. Like, they justify their their self-perceived righteousness as righteousness yeah. based yep. on the performance of others. But when... It's all, it's all a comparison. Yeah. You know, we were kind of joking about this earlier, like, I'm not Hitler. I'm like, oh, like, I've never killed anyone. Right. But yeah. Christ himself said, if you hate someone... Well, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but if you hate someone in your heart, then you might as well have murdered them. Yeah. Like that is the that is kind of the sin level that Christ is is talking about. Like he's talking about the attitude. He's talking about if you've looked at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. Mm-hmm. Like that is everyone yeah. is everyone is guilty of that. So so then like for Sorry, us, Jesus, uh, yeah, well, yeah, there you go, <laughs> Jesus Duke, and that is that's the hope. Uh, so for like us. That if we're recalibrated to think of ourselves in those terms of unrighteousness and like this is how God views mankind, the, um, what about Bible characters? Do you have any examples of of Bible characters that, <laughs> like you said, Bible characters as if they are little uh, 
felt <laughs> <laughs> felt uh, objects to put on the wall. Uh, th- that's probably like the worst term to use. Bible characters. <laughs> no, sorry. What about no, historical figures historic- that are accounted for in the Bible? Uh, I can't shake. We said it before, but it's the Isaiah aspect and how um, here's a man who comes to the temple, the throne room vision of heaven. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a prophet. So he, this guy is is to use a modern evangelical turn on fire for the Lord. Mm-hmm. Like even before what you're about to go into, like Isaiah was a, a by God's standards, probably even a great man. You know, like he served the Lord, he was faithful and he was a righteous man, like probably one of the right, most righteous men in all of Israel in God's sight. Sorry, continue. <laughs> and yeah, I think when you say righteous, you know, he had faith in the Lord. And so it brought him, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read this because, I Go for it. This yeah, is Isaiah it. 6. He asked about a Bible character. He's one of my favorites. Uh, it says, in the year of, um, I'm sorry, we're going to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him so stood the, the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4 says, And the foundations of the threshold, uh, thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe to Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. That's awesome. I mean, that's a, <laughs> that is awesome. That is a picture there of the Lord not only allowing Isaiah to see the throne, but the activity of heaven is that the angels continually sing praises to him, and they extend those praises not just to the Lord of hosts, but the whole earth is full of his glory. Yeah. And here Isaiah is like, wait a minute. The weight of your presence has now revealed the deficiencies of my my whole being. And that's and so, such a cool picture of, of salvation too. Like his sins were atoned for in that instant. Like it wasn't like that. I, I, I just can't get over the fact that it, it mentions how his, his sins were atoned for right there. Like so that's, Ethan, Ethan, when you say holy and the holiness of God, there's a part of me where it goes to an abstract reality. And I'm looking at this, and I'm like, you, you're, you, just, you hit on something. His sins were atoned for, but they were they were atoned for symbolically by a coal that was taken from an altar in heaven, and he was not burned. You know, it was put on his lips, and that's what made him holy. the The fire and the righteousness of what the altar would symbolize, like that, is what the Lord uses to cleanse him. He yeah. ch- he chose to cleanse him. While he was in the presence, before the Lord spoke, the angel spoke, and he, um, first thing he addresses is what you, you, you started this whole thing off with. He addresses Isaiah's sin, and he places yeah. the, um, the separation as a priority, and he says, that's what we're going to cover first. We're going we're yeah. to make the uh, relationship between you and I uh, practical and functional now. You're in my presence. You need to be clean because I am holy. I love that. It points me to exactly where I need to be. I need to be, need to be in a place of confession. I'm, I'm sick. I'm diseased. I'm unclean. Not just me, but everyone around me is in the same condition. And he, later on, he goes, send me, I'll go, because the Lord sends him on a mission. Right. And he realizes it's not just him, but he takes ownership of his own sin. And uh, from that, the Lord you know, responds and cleanses him of his unrighteousness that for me sums up holiness confronted with the holiness of god he was made aware of his sinfulness and it led him to repentance that's beautiful when when he (laughs) when isaiah encountered christ there was nothing said like there was nothing that jesus said to him that was you are unrighteous in my presence like there was nothing like that that was Mm -hmm. kind of audibly communicated to him it was just impulsive Mm -hmm. like he saw christ 
and he was just on his knees. Like that, that is what's powerful to me. It's, it's not, it's not God laying down his sins in front of him. Like, mm-hmm. this is what you've done to make you unrighteous. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to tell people, listen, in this passage, there's much more than what we just covered. Yeah. So yeah. I'd encourage you to go read further. And the symbolism of like, when, it, when this is kind of off topic, but the whole, um, the, the fact that the seraphim had wings covering their feet, I thought is really interesting because in several, in several places in the old Testament, um, people who are walking on holy ground were asked to take off their sandals. Like when, like when Moses approached the burning bush, he was instructed to take off his sandals. And there was also a time where I think it was, might've been Joshua mm-hmm. who approached Christ and he was told to take off his sandals. Um, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just weird. I'm, I'm sure a lot of theologians have hypothesized like why God had such a focus on, on feet, like treading on his ground. I don't know. It's just, do you guys think it, that's kind of peculiar too, the, <laughs> that, that connection there? Well, what it made me think of was in Ephesians when he's talking about the full armor of God and it talks about having your feet shod with the preparedness of the gospel. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. And But they were the ones singing, holy, holy, holy. Yeah. And they are, they're messengers. They're there attending to Christ, but also singing his praises. So you have this this picture of them saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Um, and that reminds me of, you know, how beautiful are the feet that bring good news. Those things come to my mind when when we start talking about that, dis- having that discussion. Yeah, and also the idea of when you came from another place, you brought with that symbolically, whatever it, its purpose and its meaning was, the dust on your feet bring with it the tragedy and the, the, the trauma of wherever it is that you previously held had held held your feet um symbolically on yeah and now when you've come to the lord it's as if he says we're starting new that wherever your shoes is, have went take them off now stand in my presence and i'm going to exactly what you said the symbolism on that is give you uh, you know uh, new ground to stand on and make you holy and so he strips us of anything that would be uh, a place of defilement and any of the baggage that we might bring like and our, I mean, he touched his lips with the cold too, which the the lips were often. I mean, if if we go back to that Romans three verse, it talks about the mm-hmm. lip the lips that are quick to, or the um the lips with the uh, venom of asps. the venom of asps is under their lips. Asps. That's, that's an interesting asps. Oh, asps. That's a that's <laughs> read that so many connection. ways when um, I was younger. When uh, sorry, just thinking of Indiana Jones. Anyway, carry on. <laughs> snakes Very um I, what you were talking about snakes? cody kind of also reminded me of the fact that when jesus was on earth he washed people's feet mm-hmm. i thought i think that's a cool connection here too um the fact that in the old testament god required people to, to remove their shoes or be covered in his presence and then when christ came he was the one purifying the feet mm-hmm. you know yeah, i think that's a, just a i don't know if this is the significance of that but it seems significant to me so I'm not smart enough to be able to. Well, in that give case, you an it's the, the same thing. Like <laughs> he's washing their feet because that's the you just came outside. It's kind of gross. It's the it's the servant's job to wash the feet of the guest, and so Jesus, you know, typifies the the servant leader, the one who would get down in our stuff and clean it for us. And he, um, remember, he relates to us as a high priest, and so taking our feet and applying the healing balm of whatever would be used in addition to water, but to nourish us and. And to put us on a proper foot, proper um, you know footing, the symbolism there just goes all the way back throughout the Old Testament about how yeah. when you're in a holy place, God requires us to remove our shoes and stand in at, at attention. And here the Lord gets down on the floor and He cleanses us. Um, you know, He cleanses the uh, the apostles in that scene. That and it also, just shows us He's a servant. Like He wants to serve us. He wants to do all that He can to come and make us holy. That also reminds me of how John the Baptist said that um, the one who, I think he said, I'm paraphrasing, like the one that follows me, um, I'm not even fit to tie his sandals. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And then Christ comes, who is, who is, who he was talking about and is the one untying sandals, washing feet and and Mm -hmm. all of that. And and that's, that's interesting that you brought that up. Um, We'll probably get into that a little bit later, but how Jesus purposes his whole life you know the holiness of god is that how he is we're going to get to this but he's distinct he's different he's other he's not us Mm -hmm. but in uh in identifying what is holy we can in our minds go to isaiah chapter six and we can think of 
it being heaven, the domain of holy, right. must be holy. But the life of Christ was a display of the holiness of God because he was without sin. Mm-hmm. Like that part of it, when I look at what holiness is and you 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 see it fleshed out. Yeah. Like he was in the body prepared for him, right? He was capable of sin. Um, tempted in all ways, but not having sinned. Yeah. And yeah. so that's what I mean when I say that. Um, he had a human nature like us, but he embodied the the holiness of God because he was God, and yet he does not sin. So that's how you know he's holy. Jesus never sinned as a, you know, <laughs> set, side note. We're going to probably so, get to that. So there's holiness, um, there's sin. So so why is it important to to have a discussion about sin? So to prepare for this episode, I started um, J.C. Ryle's book, Holiness, and it is, it like blew me away. Like I was posting about it on GroupMe and it, and WhatsApp and, yeah. and all of that. And one of the things that, yeah, like he starts, he's like, if you, if you guys, if you listeners out there start reading the book, you'll, you'll recognize the format that we're doing here. He goes into sin, sanctification and holiness. And so it's, it's, he, he was kind of like his writing was kind of the inspiration for the flow of, of this episode. Um, and he says, this is what he says about sin. Sin is a disease which perverts and runs through every part of our moral constitution and every faculty of our minds to understand the, to the understanding, the affections, the reasoning powers, the will are all more or less infected. Even the conscience is so blinded that it cannot be de- be dependent on as a sure guide and is as likely to lead men wrong as right unless it is enlightened by the Holy Ghost. This corruption brings with it an incredible ignorance. Um of and a distance from perfection. So that's that's what I wanted to. Um, that's why I wanted to talk about sin before we talk about holiness. Is because we need to, we need to have an understanding of the the distance, and we can't understand it fully until we are probably in heaven. We probably cannot even have an exhaustive understanding on the the difference between holiness and sin, because that is an infinite, probably an infinitely large difference. Mm-hmm. And and to like try to exhaustively like handle it is just too much. Right, um, right. But I th- I think we can we can all agree that man is absolutely sinful, and God is absolutely holy. And and the, and the reason why the reason why man is so sinful is not because he is comparatively sinful. He to like he's not comparatively sinful to any other person. He is comparatively sinful to holiness like that is that is kind of the the um exchange that we need to be thinking about am i perfect no how far am i from perfect infinitely far from perfect (laughs) so that is kind of what we need to understand is that we are infinitely not perfect because god is holy i have sinned against you and you alone lord yeah that's the relational component that may you may have sinned against somebody and you could actually ask their forgiveness and it could possibly come from them but you've sinned against the Lord alone because of the violation of what sin is. It's a, it's a, an affront to the holiness of God. You cannot be in His presence. And so, yeah, you're you're hitting on something here. Um, some theologians have called the the aspect of how sinful we are as total depravity or radical corruption, mm-hmm. and yep. how it touches not just on the physical aspect of man, but it talks about our our spiritual condition and yeah. how we are radically corrupted. We are radically different from what Adam was originally designed for. And our um, our um, bondage in that type of condition is wholesale. It touches everything. The mind, the soul, you know, the heart, all of our will, it's, it's corrupted and it's not perfect. And I think that's the distinction that was made is that Jesus is called the second Adam because yeah. he is perfect. But in light of that, it's the focusing not to the uh, point where it becomes your full identity, because in Christ you're made new. But mm-hmm. if you forget how far away you were from God, and you um, forget about what besets you, the the the, the common sins of your life, and you if you forget that you have remaining sin, and how far down this corruption goes, it's not just on the surface level where I could be kind to somebody, 
or you know you can give a good gift and that shows them that you've got a changed heart but it goes down to the intentions of why you gave that gift and why you do the things you do and if yeah. it's not from a pure place of worship the lord knows and the um the idea that we're just a little bit off and we're we're good people by nature is um it's outright heresy it's not right it's a false teaching and to not believe that your body and your soul have been totally corrupted gives you um, a, a handicap on how you can ask for God to intervene and help you know in the process of sanctification. Because if you dismiss how corrupt sin is in your life, you kind of miss out on an opportunity to uh, gain a uh, r- participate in the reality of God's holiness. All right, so I wanted to talk about, okay, so now we've talked about sin. We've kind of hammered it home as far as the importance, why it's important. Now you guys feel real crummy probably. So we're going we're, we're gonna to talk about the happy stuff, um, happy yeah, yeah. stuff and exciting the holy stuff. stuff. We need a, a solution stuff. to our sin problem. Yes, 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 and we have a solution. Why does the path that leads to destruction narrows the path that leads to eternal life? Eternal life. Eternal life. <laughs> Uh, so Ephesians, I wanted to read uh, to kind of intro, I wanted to read Ephesians twelve eighteen through 21. And it says, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and a sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, to them, for they cannot, for they could not endure the order that was given. If, if even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble in fear. That was Hebrews 12, yep. 18 through 21. It also occurs in Exodus. So this is, this is talking about a, a different encounter Moses had with God before um, they were getting ready to go into the promised land. Yes, correct. And uh, and Moses wanted to see the glory of God. He knew he wasn't going to make it into the promised land. He had already disobeyed God. Here in Exodus 33, he says, Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will, will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Would you mind reading Isaiah thirty three thirteen through 16, Mr. Trail? All right, Isaiah thirty three thirteen through 16 says, Hear you who are far off what I have done, and you who are near acknowledge my might. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has received the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Who walks righteously and speaks uprightly? Who despises to gain of the gain of oppressors? Who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe? Who stops his ears from hearing the, of the bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking on evil? He who sorry, he will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Yeah, so I wanted to read those verses because each each one of those kind of shows an aspect of of God's holiness. In the Hebrews twelve eighteen um, verse, it talks about how God was dwelling on Mount Sinai, and no one could could touch the mountain um, because mm-hmm. they would be stoned. And kind of the symbolism there is is talking about how God is untouchable. That that whole idea um, without atoning without purifying purification without sanctification um you like there is no seeing god there is no reaching god there is no living in the presence of god it is it is justice um and then the exodus 33 verse i liked because it says um, for a man cannot see my face and live um i i I, like that whole that verse just kind of reminds me of Isaiah 6. Um, Because obviously what the person of the Godhead that's talked about in Isaiah 33 is different than the person of the Godhead that Isaiah saw. You might have heard me talk about how Isaiah saw Christ on the throne. And that's that's who Isaiah was seeing because Christ later 
um, says that no one has seen the father except the one that has come from the father. So that kind of shows us like all of these, all of these Old Testament historical figures are see if like if they see God, they see Christ. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Cody, you you and I have talked about this. How one of the attributes of of Christ is that he is kind of the relational head between the Trinity and Earth. Like like creation was made through him creation was made for him so creation was made by him you know so it's a kind of mediator mediator exactly he is the mediator um and also to was it jake who was the one who wrestled with with jacob, the angel? jacob. yeah jacob yeah yeah broke his a hip. lot of yeah touch his hip i actually believe that he was wrestling with christ um because mm-hmm. of how jacob um addressed him he addressed him as lord with the proper with the proper um and that's how you proper, do it. That's a prayer. Yeah, that's how you do it. <laughs> you basically say, angels, I ain't leaving until you give me a blessing. He's like, all right, I'll break your, break your hip and give you a blessing. And, and the, But also uh, him changing his name to uh, Israel right after that. Wrestles yes. with God. Yes. I mean, that's his name. Uh-huh. Wrestled yeah. with God. So it's not like he wrestled just with an angel. Israel. Yeah. El. Yeah. And, when, and whenever an angel receives worship, they they tell them not <laughs> no, no, to. No, 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 <laughs> no. Don't. <laughs> no, don't do it. Nope. <laughs> because, I mean... I, I was reading, I forget what, what gospel it was, um, a couple weeks ago, I was reading about how, you know, I think it was when the angel came to John the Baptist, either his mother or his father, um, father. they just like, father, yeah, he, they, he just like fell prostrate, <laughs> just as a result, and it says that he did that as a result of seeing God's glory reflected mm-hmm. off of the angel. And that kind of reminds me of Isaiah six, how when you see God's glory, it's worship. Like it's compul I, I call it compulsive worship, but it's not really it's not really forced in the way that it's like, get down on your knees before me. It's it's when we are when we see that, our only response is worship. Because it's it just like like Isaiah, it just tore him apart. You know, I've had that happen at um, and, and again, this is not the the church or the setting. It's just when God is so present in a message, um, and in the moment where you're basically you're done, and you you just want to worship, and mm-hmm. there's something in your heart where you said a compulsive wor- worship, where it would be disobedient for me not to get on my knees right now, and yeah, I'm yeah. not a guy that can easily get on my knees. I'm mm-hmm. a big guy. And um, for me, I, I, you know, I'm not going to do that just because it's comfortable or something I think is going to draw attention to me. I've done that and it's been uncomfortable. Yeah. And I realized that when I got down here, I didn't know that I got down here, but I was, I'm on the floor. I'm praying. There's a situation, not necessarily a church situation, but you're at home and you just, you, you are seeking the face of the Lord, his presence, and you want what... Moses is asking for, you want to see the glory of God, yeah. and you're not asking for an answer. You don't want an audible sign. You just want the comfort of knowing uh, you know, that your heavenly Father hears you. And the only thing I can think of, because I see the model in Scripture, but it's my heart's led to it. I get on my face. I get down and yeah. I weep. And there's been times in, my, in many seasons where I just weep, yeah. just pray. And um, sometimes I'll even put a blanket over my head and I just like that covering just uh-huh. I'm there. I'm like just, sackcloth. Yeah, sackcloth and ashes. Yeah. Um. So that part, I totally have experienced that. I see that in scripture, and the compulsory component of it is like, I got nothing to offer you. I'm gonna lay down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've had times like that in my life. There was. I'm not gonna really go into it because it's personal. But during Grace's first semester at physical therapy school down in down here in ODU, um, she was having like she struggled a lot like spiritually, um, like forces of evil type stuff, demonic dreams, like that was very palpable and very aware um, in her first semester. And I'm not really one of the ones who, like I, like some Christians have, are more attuned to the, the um, like the demonic realm than I am. I'm not really one to, to kind of call things demonic because because it's not as I'm not aware of it as a lot of people are, but there was like clear, clear demonic oppression um, going on um, with with Grace, and there was one day where Grace was like one of the worst days Grace has, had had that whole semester, and I just 
like sense that I needed to pray for her and I was I was like scared like have you have you guys ever like scared prayed before just like crying and sobbing and just like crying out to the Lord and like making deals with the Lord like if you like <laughs> Lord please be with her and if you do this I will like serve you and like that whole thing and I don't I'm, I'm not saying that that is necessarily biblical but it was just out of my heart um and I actually ended up leaving work <laughs> because I just felt so burdened to pray for grace like i left work crying and drove home 30 minutes crying and called her and was praying with her and um it was just like really pow- powerful and it was palpable um and it wasn't like i just knew that that i just needed to go to the lord and just like spiritually just kneel in front of him and just be in prayer um so it, it's not as it's not as physical as what you're talking about, Cody. But I definitely know like what that compulsive, like I need to I need to interface with God compulsively right now. Like I have no choice. Like I need I need to do this because it would be disobedient not to. So I definitely know definitely know what that feels like. So yeah. So um, back to what we were talking about. Um, so we're we're getting into holiness here and kind of what that means. And when I was studying for this episode, I found a really good definition by Louis Burkhoff um, in his Systematic Theology. He says, It is quite evident, however, that holiness in this sense of the word is not really a moral attribute which can be coordinated with the others, such as love, grace, and mercy, but is rather something that is coextensive with and applicable to everything that can be predicated of God. He is holy in everything that reveals him, in his goodness and grace, as well as his justice and wrath. Um, so the way I understand it is there's kind of two distinctions between the Bible's use. And Cody, I wanted, I wanted you to go into this because you studied the actual Greek and the Hebrew here, so you would have a better understanding of it than I do. But there's, there's, a, there's an aspect of holiness that's kind of holistically revealed in Scripture that's hard to exactly pinned down. And I think that's what Louis Burkhoff is explaining here as coextensive. Um, mm-hmm. So what he means is like this, there's an aspect of God's holiness that is present in every single one of his attributes. Because when you look up the definition of holiness and the origins of at least one of the words that's used for holiness, it means separate, mm-hmm. set apart, significantly different. The thing that jumps out at me is that, uh, I mean, just the pure revelation of God um, According to this de- definition, uh, he is holy in everything that reveals him. Uh, goodness, grace, justice, wrath, like all of these things are holy. And it, it reminds me, every time God is called holy in the scriptures, it's used three times. Normally, when you wanted to say something important in the scriptures, it's twice. Like Truly, truly, I say to you. Yeah, truly, truly, <laughs> verily, verily, those sorts of things. Uh, or, you know, the, the Hebrew phraseology will be uh, phrased in like a parallel sentence. Like you say something and then you say it, like you re reaffirm it in a, in a kind of like parallel way right afterwards. Um, but God's the only one who gets holy, holy, holy three times. Yeah, yeah. In the, in the Hebrew, the, um, that is called the superlative. Um, it's a, it's a, an exaggerated or it's an exaggerated or hyperbolic expression of phrase where you cannot go any further than this, um, try aspect of the holiness of God. He is holy, holy, holy. It's like holy to an infinity, uh, measure. And so that part of this is just, it's supreme. It's the most outstanding. It's the, the premier, the unsurpassed aspect of God's holiness is on display and you, there's, they've run out of words to explain it. So just say it three times. <laughs> so just say it three times. And it's a marker too, because <laughs> no other person gets attributed to that holy, holy, holy. And we might um, see it and get familiar with it. But um, Ethan, if you're familiar with uh, the, the, the hymn that's associated with this, holy, 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 Lord God almighty. I love um, that one. Is written by Reginald Hebbard in 1783. Um, oh, Reginald. I'm, <laughs> Reginald. I'm going to read a little bit of it because I think this is something where it's an act of worship in response to what holy is. You just read Burkhoff's definition of that. Everything that's revealed about God is holy. His justice, his might, his love, his mercy. But the response of the saint 
we can't really quantify truly in ex- in, in a um, expressive way, other than to sing praise to him. And so when this song was first um, introduced into my mind, it was um, I received it because I, that, that those are the words that I would put to a hymn or a song, a spiritual song, back to the Lord in adoration and praise, because that's what holiness should lead to. It should lead to a reflection and then a declaration back. And um, it goes, Holy, 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 Lord, Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which art, which wert and art, and evermore shalt be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye made blind by sin, thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee. Perfect in power, love, and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thee, thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Mm. I sing that chorus to my children every night to sleep. Uh And when they ask, Daddy, sing me a song, it's either Jesus loves me, um, do Lord. I love that one. Do Lord, oh do Lord. Do remember me. Yeah. Or it's holy, (laughs) holy, holy. And the, the, the most beautiful thing, young men out there, young fathers, is when your daughters are eager to hear you sing holy, holy, holy. Mm-hmm. And they're grasping a concept of who God is through these songs that we sing to them. And it brought me to tears for the first time a couple of months ago when my daughters um, sing holy, holy, holy again, daddy. Mm-hmm. And I was like, in my heart, I was like, yes, <laughs> sing it five times, babe. <laughs> <laughs> and I sang holy, and then I didn't say the other two. And uh-huh. they go, it goes, holy, 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 dad. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. They just felt the reverence and the, uh, the, that aspect that it's the highest praise. Suddenly under conviction that I have been singing Sleeping Beauty songs to my daughter. <laughs> I don't even know what those songs are, but uh, probably good, right? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing terrible in them. Anyway, back yeah, to yeah, holy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> back to you, could lead, you could lead into talking about your infant daughter, about how she's beautifully and wonderfully made. Yeah, oh, lead in straight into that. Well, she is. She's a beautiful little girl. She is. Um, <laughs> the song that you were you were talking about, Cody, reminded me of uh, Revelation four, mm-hmm. um, when the like the it, Revelation four talks about the throne of heaven and kind of all of the um, the elders and and the creatures in front of the temple worshiping, and it goes like this. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind the first living creature like a lion the second living creature like an ox the third living creature with the face of a man and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight and the four living creatures each of them with six wings are full of eyes all around them and within and day and night they never cease to say holy 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 is the lord god almighty who has and is and is to come And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. Uh, To see that one day. Looking Mm -hmm. forward to it, gents. That's one of my favorite passages. Yeah. Really? Uh, Yeah. Yeah, because what it entails, what it represents, Christ receiving these things, Christ inheriting the earth, receiving the worship that is due him. I think we've talked about this in a previous episode, so I won't belabor the point. Do you, did you want to go into the definitions of holiness that you looked up, Cody? The the two words. So the Hebrew word that's associated with holiness in the Old Testament is kadash, and uh, the Greek New Testament is hagios, and both of those correspond to God's holiness. And obviously, the context will give the definition. And even if it's the first word used um, in the you know either one of those, the 
the in the Greek or in the Hebrew, that sets a precedence of what holy holiness or that word in particular will mean going forward. The definition of the context. Yeah. Um, so some it's of these kinda, passages it kind of molds itself into whatever whatever passage it's whatever use it's 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 in. Yeah. So um, Kadash and Hagios both are ref, are, are distinguishing. Um, definitions of who God is. He's, he's holy. We got that. He's majestically holy. So that's a component of this that kind of needs to be fleshed out a little bit when we talk about how God's character is uncompromising. Mm-hmm. His character is far above anything we can actually grasp or know. And that character meaning like his person and his, and his attributes, not at least in the majestic holiness you're talking about, it's it's not his character as in his like moral character. It's talking about like his being, his essence, his attributes are on a different plane and different reality, for lack of a better word, than than ours are. Is that yeah. kind of what you're getting? Like at? his transcendency is distinct from all other creations, and is an, he has an infinite majest, you know, majesty. Like that's like a a phrase that you can kind of flesh out a little bit, but you can't equate yourself to that. Mm-hmm. Like he is altogether different. He is holy. He is other. Um, the idea of something being holy is that it is distinct. It's separated. And we consecrate and we sac- and we put things as sacred to set them apart. And God in himself is already set apart because he is not creation. He is not corruptible. He is not changeable. He so he has unique. to himself yeah. a um, um, an area. His whole being is uncompromisable. And so it's majestic. And some of the passages speak to that. Uh, if we can go through these gentlemen, which have the word Gadash in there, is Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Someone please go there. I got it. And then, uh, Seth, can you grab Psalm chapter 5, verses 7? Mm-hmm. Got it. And then Exodus. Um, sorry, go oh, ahead. Oh, go ahead. Exodus 15, 11 says, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. I wanted to read that because it was cool. Well, talk part. about that. Like, what does that mean? We just we just said the majestic is no one like you. What, what are you seeing there, Ethan? Well, well, one of the things we have to recognize is the context. Um, so, let me just scroll up. So, this is the Song of Moses. Um, and... And this is kind of talking about God's justice on Pharaoh, I think. It's kind of like hearkening back to, it's it's kind of like Moses' praise right after the Exodus. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, in, in, in verse four, it says, Pharaoh's chariots and his law in, and his hosts he cast into the sea and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them, and they went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overflow, overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. And then God said, or and then Moses says, you blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds? doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. And then he starts going into steadfast love. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But that's talking about how God just, like no one can stand, no one can stand against God. (laughs) Like God just destroyed them just easily, like flippantly almost. Um, And that's kind of what, what Moses is talking about. He saw God's um, God's love for the Israelites there in destroying the Egyptians, and he was just praising as a result. Yeah, it was also um, God's righteous judgment on a people that mm-hmm. were set against Him. Yep, uh, and consistently just detest 
de- they detested the Israelites. They tortured them and and held them in captivity. Like that is God's justice right there, you and, know. And the man that led them considered himself a deity, considered himself God. Yeah. yeah. And was helpless. He fell underneath the waters. Kind of reminds me of the passage in Revelation where you see Satan and the beast and the prophet and all thrown all thrown, cohorts, into the pit. thrown into the uh, the fiery lake the mm-hmm. lake of unquenchable sulfur that's what i'm reminded of and when you see those two paralleled you see the awesomeness of god oh yeah and the might of god in comparison to his enemies and uh, uh and you see how wanting they are as formidable as they may seem god is clearly greater in all ways psalm 5 verse 7 anywhere around that you can read more or less all right but i through the abundance of your steadfast love will enter your house i will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you lead me O lord in your righteousness because of my enemies make your way straight before me so i like that verse because it mentions fear um and and fear and meekness in a biblical context kind of go together. Um, and I think a lot of people miss what fear of the Lord means and what meekness means. Um, the reason why I say they go together is because the result of realizing our depravity and God's holiness, the result is like a reverence, a fear. And then um, being meek in a biblical context means 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 submitting yourself to God in in essence like submitting yourself to God's plan submitting yourself to God's will submitting yourself to God's law or God's word you know um that's kind of meekness holiness and and um fear of the Lord kind of I think all kind of go together they're called they're all kind of in the same kind of stream of of worship in mm-hmm. a way we're going to move to the other aspect of this is John 17, verse 11. And then did you read Revelation 4, 8? Yeah. Yep. Can you go to Revelation 15, 4? That's the one you'll read, Ethan. On the nub. Revelation 15, 4. Yeah. And then Seth, if you can grab um, Peter, 1 Peter 15, 1 Peter 1, mm-hmm. 15 and 16. Um, that'll segue us into our next part, but John chapter 17, verse 11 in this particular text, it's the uh, dubbed in my translation the high priestly prayer. This is where the Lord Jesus Christ himself is praying on behalf of his disciples. But he goes in and he says, not just these that are here, but those that will come after. And he is giving them um, this intercessory prayer that um, it gives insight into the mind of Christ and how he is thinking and how he prays for in accordance to the people and with God in mind. So I'm just going to read this for us. It says, verse 12, says, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me, and I have guarded them. And not one of them has has lost, except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and those things that I speak in the world, I'm sorry, that they may have my joy f- filled in themselves, and I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. And because you are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth, and your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. And he goes on and um, he essentially is um, highlighting how he's distinct. He's in the world, but he's not going to um, allow them to be corrupted by the world insofar as that they, um, you know, are attached or abided, they abide with him. And he goes on in this prayer and he talks about how that's possible because he's keeping them and he hasn't lost any of them. But they um they are seeing here that that Christ is praying for them and on their behalf um he wants them to be like him. And that's another component of our our ability to be holy is to become more like Christ. And that's 
going into Revelation chapter 15 and 4, um, gonna I got you. show us a little bit more of what that looks like. Great and, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, who will not fear the Lord and glorify his name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And then the uh, First Peter one fifteen and sixteen, and that's all I got. As opposed to, um, or in in addition to that, is the the ethical and the moral aspect of God's holiness is not that, not just that He's majestically holy, but that His actions and His statutes, His uh, law, and everything that He has revealed to us is absolutely a reflection of His holiness and. God, you know, he hates sin and he demands purity, but he also allows his people to come to him with clean hands because he's cleansed them. And so his his holiness also uh, enables us to become holy because he's revealed yeah. to us the path. Absolutely. So in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to read 13, 14, 15, and 16, mm-hmm. just for context. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yes. Speaks for itself. Yeah. Before we move on to the last, um, the ending section, I wanted to go through just a couple or just a few of the aspects some of the um, the coextensive holy attributes of God. There's a mouthful. Um, so just a couple here. Um, holy goodness. So God is is completely separate and distinct from us in how good He is. And I'm just going to run through the the proof texts real quick. Um, so Psalm 31 9. Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in in you in the sight of the children of mankind. And then James 1, 5, if any of you lacks wit, wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to to all without reproach and it will be given him. Then God's holy grace, Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace you have been saved through, th- through faith and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. And then God's holy understanding or wisdom, James 3, 7, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good gifts, impartial and sincere. And this is one of your favorites, Cody. God's holy impassibility. James 1.17, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Then Malachi 3, 6, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, uh, therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. And then Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. Awesome. And I would love to go, we should definitely do like episodes specifically on these, like goodness, grace, understanding wisdom, and passability, because they're big topics. And I also <laughs> think that uh, it's, it's a good thing to, probably throw in here, R.C. Sprawl's The Holiness of God. It's like the four, fourth chapter until he starts to get into a definition of holiness mm-hmm. because he goes through his experience, Luther's story, Augustine's story. He goes through a, a lot of this stuff to get to the holiness, the holiness of God, not because it's so abstract, but because it's, it's a thing when you define it, it's set up through um, not just experiences, but how it affects you. Mm-hmm. Some people can say theologically, like, oh, I agree with the holy, holiness of God. But do but, you, though? But their life does not correspond to the the, the fear and the reverence that should be um, pulled and drawn out of you. And so, you know, R.C. Sproul's The Holiness of God is a book that I would recommend that you read because he, the way that he wrote his book was more, it is a theological book, but if you haven't read, read it, I encourage you to. Because it, it's he's, very, he's it's very approachable, story. the way he reads it. Yeah, he's it's very approachable us, for the for the average person. He's telling a story of how he came to understand um, the holiness of God, how historical figures have come to realize that, how biblical characters, Seth, 
Biblical characters. <laughs> These historical <laughs> figures have come to experience it. And he just, he helps you mo- like uh, mold it out in your, in your mind. And yeah. um, so I recommend that if we're going to do some recommendations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, I, since we're doing them right now, I wanted to, the whole, I mean, Holiness by J.C. Ryle is a, a must if you guys yeah, want to dig into this more. It's more of a theological book. I don't like using that word um, because any books about God are theological, but it, it, it is a little bit more wordy, um, but it's it's awesome. Like it's yeah. it just blew me away last week. It's one of those so, books that I, I have to read out loud in order yeah. to get the most out of. I'm finding that about myself. I just need to read out loud. Apparently, yep. I'm an audible learner. Um, Even if it's audible to yourself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Grace is an audible learner too, which I'm not. So I may read four times, one, after, one time after the other learner. So yeah, I... I got sick of that, so I just started reading <laughs> out loud. Yeah, um, yeah. So I got a question for you guys. So we've discussed the sinfulness of man. We've discussed the holiness of God. But before we get to sanctification, the question is, how does sinful man get to stand before a holy God? Well, the first part of that question is, all men and women stand before God. Like right. they, they do. Like they are in a, like they are in a, you're in a relationship with God. You're in a covenantal relationship with God, whether you want to or not. You're either under the law or under grace. Like there's no, there, like you, if you're not under grace, you default to being under the law. Well, I guess my, so, my question was to be more specific was um, we've already discussed that, you know, man, cannot see the face of God and live. Right. Uh, and we've talked about sin being a re- resulting in death and, and how that cannot stand before God. So then what is the remedy? Yep. I, I have an answer for you. It's, um, it's, it's the second half of the Hebrews 12 verse that, that I, that we talked about earlier. Okay. So, um, Hebrews 12, um, 22 through 24 talks about this exact thing. So one of the reasons why I really like this, this passage is it talks about two mountains symbolically. It talks about Mount Sinai and Mount Zion and kind of the two categories that it talks about are the two covenants. So it's either you're in covenant with with Mount Sinai or you're in covenant with Mount Zion. Either you're in the covenant of the law or the covenant of grace. And picking up in, ver- in uh, verse 22, it says, but you, speaking to uh, the Hebrews, um, but you have come to Mount Zion in the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of angel, the blood of Abel. So in this in this first mountain, we see if you touch it, you'll be stoned. And in the second mountain, it's festal gathering. Um, the firstborns, the the firstborn who are, who are enrolled in heaven, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Um, and it says in the end, Christ, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So the key here is the sprinkled blood. Like that is mm-hmm. the Christ is the 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 final Passover lamb. Like his sprinkled blood being applied to our lives is what saves us from Mount Zion, yeah, from and, uh, that trembling fear being being punished for, our, for rightfully for our sin. In, uh, in that first Peter passage, if you continue on, um, it says, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Yeah, and, and the the Old Testament callback to that is the Passover lamb. Like traditionally, the Passover lamb was one without blemish or spot. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the answer to your question is Christ. Like Christ mm-hmm. applied blood, Christ's imputed righteousness um, is is what saves us from that. 
Mm-hmm. So, and it, and it, what an, it, 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 it is what enables us to see God. Um, Cody, what was that verse that you, you, you said? Um, oh, it's, it's Hebrews twelve fourteen. Mm-hmm. It says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see God. So this, there is a holiness that we must attain, and we'll talk about how to attain it. There's a holiness that you must attain to be able to see God. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you won't. Um, so, Cody Trail, how do you attain this holiness? Tell us. I must yeah. know. John 3.16, man. I mean, this is some basic Oh, come stuff. on. Are you going to John 3.16 <laughs> joke no, me? John, John 3.16 is never <laughs> fleshed out Go. accurately. Uh, yeah, he he so loved the whole world, the cosmos, those which would believe, all those that are believing will have this um, you know, changed identity. They'll be made into new creatures. And so in that, the holiness of God penetrates so far and so wide that they become new creations. Um, they, w- they walk that out in reality by walking by the Spirit. And it's given to them at the point of their regeneration, and so they believe and they confess, and that the Greek structure of uh, John three sixteen is all those that are believing they continue in the belief, and so there is a holiness without which no man will see the Lord, mm-hmm. and the holiness is given to us. It's the holiness which is unmatched because we can't bring anything to the Lord, but we strive for peace among all men, and that's the proof and the evidence that we've been transformed and created to be uh, created in the image of God, uh, reborn, as you would say. He's caused us to be born again, and it's for the purpose that we wouldn't perish. The mm-hmm. holiness without which no men will see the Lord is so that we might not perish, both in the presence of men, because we want to strive for peace, but also we won't perish because God has preserved us. He's taken us to this place. He's seated us, seated us in heavenly places, as Ephesians talks about. And so the everlasting life isn't something that we should ex- you know, claim to experience later. We We have the down payment now with the Holy Spirit, giving us the ability to walk a life that's holy. And if you don't know that that's some a reality for Christians now, John 3.16 tells us that. God loves us, gave us life in His Son, and it's everlasting. And the way that you um, walk that out is by, an, by a, um, a life that corresponds to God's righteous requirements. It's, it's holiness. Mm-hmm. You can't walk around doing the same things that you did prior to your encounter with you know, the gospel message. It says, repent. Mm-hmm. Change yep. your mind on the things which you were doing before and believe. Confess with your mouth, with your mouth and um, you will be saved. So repentance and belief go to action. And holiness is the thing which shows that we're progressing towards a place that's in agreement to God's will for our lives. You know, sanctification is the de- decreasing effects of uh, sin in our life and the decreasing desires for us to want to fulfill those desires. As and we talk incre- about, hmm? sorry, as, as we talk, I mean, the guys of shield wall kind of all talk about this as like strongholds being broken down, oh, yeah. like sanct- sanctification are the strongholds of the enemy, the strongholds of sin being destroyed. Mm-hmm. And so if you're, if you're not serious with your relationship with Christ, you're, you're, you're not going to be serious with your relationship with your, with your sin. Yeah. You're going to play with it. There's a um, story somebody told me where they're watching like the National Geographic, National Geographic, and some man was uh, a lion tamer, and he's walking out and he's paint, he's you know petting a lion's mane, you know just you <laughs> yeah. know this is my pet, and um, you, you you immediately watch that. You're not trained, but you watch that. And you're like that. That's not going to end well. Like you cannot <laughs> have a pet lion. It might be cute in the moment, but mm-hmm. in an instinct, that lion comes out and it will swallow you whole. Like you cannot have sin as a pet. You can't keep it and think that the maim is something that you can just gently, you know, comb and it gives you some sort of pleasure or you're able to moderate its behaviors. Like yeah. sin will creep up on you and it will destroy you and you'll ruin the name of Christ. You will. So the holiness I get passionate about this one. <laughs> the holiness without which no man will see the Lord is experiential. Like you have to exhibit saving faith outwardly it's a it's a requirement yeah i think that the lord requires that of us because we it do not to want to you know um use and proclaim his name in vain the effectiveness of this regeneration 
or in sanctification and being changed, being born again, the effectiveness of that is made evident in the outflowings of that thing. Yeah. Fruits, the fruits of sin are clear. The fruits of righteousness are clear. Um, and, and yeah, what you're saying is, is spot on. Like if your life doesn't exemplify, begin to and continue to exemplify cry, uh, God's just keep on going, keep on trucking. <laughs> um, we have a train in one of our recording near one of our recording studios and we just kind of truck through. So, um, yeah. So if your life doesn't show God and how you're living, how you're, how you're communing with God, how you're communing with others, how you're a present part of the church, how you're um, partaking in the two sacraments. Like, you need to search yourself, and you need to, to, to be in prayer, and you need to be in the Word, because otherwise, like, you could be in danger. I mean, I'm not trying to, like, scare people into the kingdom. I'm just saying, like, you need to be aware of, of where you are spiritually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Psalm 139, 23 says, Search me, God, and oh God, and know my heart, and test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offense, offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Test yourself all day long, but if you ask the Lord to seek in your innermost being, he will, re- he will reveal. He, he will respond to that prayer. In uh, Galatians chapter 5, um, it says, uh, by, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. To yes. to be led by the Spirit. Uh, I talked to my wife about this. Um, being obedient to God in our relationship, specifically with you know me and Cassandra, it was it was evident that the things that caused me to run away, to want to run away, whether that be like running away from resolution or whatever, uh, those were all sinful things. I wasn't going to be obedient to God in my relationship if I gratified those desires, but. If I followed the sp- the Spirit's leading in those things, and I was obedient to Christ to resolve an issue or to seek forgiveness or whatever it was, um, those things drew me closer to my wife, and it drew me closer to God. Uh, and the whole point is to become more and more like Christ. Yep. To become the uh the image of christ here on earth to a lost and dying world and and we have that ability now we've gone from being dead in our sins and transgressions to being alive in christ and having eternal life like if you go to john first john i mean you talk about having possessing it is in your possession eternal life like this is the thing that the holiness of god um the holiness of Christ imputed to you through his death on the cross and his resurrection. You have access to eternal life. Now you have access to walk in the spirit. You have access to victory in Jesus Christ so that you don't have to despair when things get really stupid and tough at work or in your relationship or when you're confronted with an addiction, um, things or, or a stronghold, whatever it is, whether it's a generational curse, whether you're coming up against a deadline on your taxes, you know, you can go to God on your knees in confidence that he hears you and that he will save you. He will deliver you, whatever that may be. And, uh, and this is all going to be done by the power of Christ, by the Holy Spirit, like becoming a man of God who can walk in righteousness through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. It's not going to be easy. You're going to be confronted with a lot of junk that's in your life, but it's going to be awesome because mm. when you look back, you look back at the mountain that you've, you've been treading. And like, I look at my wife and I say, I love being in a relationship with you. I love getting to see every day more and more how you, how you reflect Christ. And it's super exciting just to see the work of God in the lives of two broken and uh, broken and wretched people who've now been redeemed and can actually do 
works for the kingdom of God. Um, so that's, I can't wait to have that in my marriage. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it's it. It's coming. Being married is going to be awesome. Yeah. What I wanted to wrap up with, um, is, is just, just this God, God being completely holy, unique, rare, separate means that he is infinitely valuable. Anything that is, that is unique, rare, and separate is valuable and worth seeking. This, this being ought to be the end all be all of our life. This, this should be who we strive for. This should be who we hope for and praise and commune with because it is like communing with God is something that is far reaching in our lives. So hear me when I say this, God is very hard to draw close to. There is only one way. That way is not of our will, but of God's through his electing power and drawing power through Christ Jesus' atonement. Drawing close to God is impossible in, a, in, of, in and of ourselves, but what is impossible for man is possible with God. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. If we had a th- better theological handle on the corruption of man under Adam and the holiness of God, we wouldn't rebel against the undeserved and uninitiating, uninitiated electing grace of God from all eternity. Like sin, we need to understand this. Holiness, we need to understand this because it correctly orients us to God. That's Amen. that's Amen. that's that's the uh, that's the rub right there. So I wanted to also conclude with this. There is a remedy revealed for man's needs as wide and broad and deep as man's disease. We need not be afraid to look at sin and study its nature, origin, power, extent, and vileness. If we only look at the same time at the almighty medicine provided for us and the salvation that is in Jesus Christ. That's all I got. Well, guys, we have given you a plethora of information mm-hmm. about God's holiness and man's sinfulness. So thank you, Ethan, for all the time you put into this and Cody for yeah. all of your thoughts and exegesis. And uh, until next time, hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line. Thank you for listening to the Shield Wall Podcast. Our goal is to glorify Christ and strengthen the hearts of men. We've got more episodes on the way, so if you liked what you heard, subscribe and share. For more info and articles, visit our website, shieldwalldiscipleship.org. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Just search for Shield Wall Discipleship. Thanks again, and until next time, hold the line.